What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. My guest, the one and only, the Rachel Hotmeyer. You can follow her on Twitter at Rachel Hotmeyer. Rachel, let's start with the most important question. What was the absolute best food that you ate during Thanksgiving? Um, box stuffing can't be beat. I predicted that going into this matchup and I, that is still my, my number one wide out at this point in time, but I will say I do make a mean brisket and I'm very proud of how that turned out. Also got a lot of compliments to the chef on that one. So that was pretty good. I will also say, uh, we were lacking a sweet potato dish, still disappointment that that Matchup didn't happen position wise, but again, we had a lot of progress on field movement. I will say that someone brought a different green bean dish this week. It was green beans, amandine, kind of a a different type of cooking and almond crusted than just casserole. The casserole was great, a classic, but the amandine took everybody by surprise. So that might be on future draft boards. What about you? (laughs) What's that? What about you? How was the pizza? Oh, the pizza was phenomenal. So we did the homemade, we had the dough, we had, uh, you know, the, the, obviously the marinara sauce, tons and tons of mozzarella cheese with a little bit of provolone in there. Uh, we had the fresh pepperonis from the deli onions and then basil on top. It was, it turned, it was the best homemade pizza I've ever had. Uh, so I was very excited about it. And so our tradition as mentioned is everybody gets to choose their favorite meal. So Mine, of course, was pizza. Xavier had pancakes where the pancakes came in. Sue's had all the sweets and everything like that. So if you saw the cupcakes and things like that, she also did French fries uh, because why not? And then Elijah, who is our healthy eater of the group, uh, he went to a festival and chose this huge fruit platter, just massive fruit platter down to the entire thing, just pounded fruit for like half an hour and was as happy as happy could be. So that was our uh, Thanksgiving meal was pizza, pancakes, French fries, fruit platter, uh, you know, desserts. And it was, it was perfect. But pizza, of course, took the cake. No, I'm so glad Elijah felt some responsibility here to be the nutritionally conscious one. The youngest one, the youngest (laughs) one uh, still, he doesn't know any better yet. So he's still pounding fruits and vegetables, but no, it was a fantastic Thanksgiving. I have to ask you though, Did you see this Packers Rams outcome coming? And did you see this team being at nine and three with all the injuries? Because I'll be the first to admit I underestimated this team. Yeah, I I definitely didn't see this win being as significant and, and dominant as it was. I definitely didn't predict the Packers Rams matchup to put the most complete, in my opinion, green and gold game performance out there of the season so far. I don't think it's perfect, but you know, when I asked LaFleur, do you think this is the most complete game? I asked that because I think this is the most complete game they've put out there so far. And I'm interested in his tape analysis on that. I definitely thought that the Rams would pose more of an offensive struggle. Obviously they did let OBJ get one, but I still thought that was going to be a bit harder. Rogers went seven for seven on Ramsey. I just didn't expect this to be as commanding of a Packers win for sure. I, I could have seen either team winning, honestly. No, I totally agree. And and as people who listen, know, I definitely picked the Rams to win ahead of time. And I mean, man, that was an impressive performance. The, the Rams are definitely a little bit worse than I expected at this point. And I know that they're trying to integrate some new players, but uh, that was a disjointed effort all across the board, but give Green Bay credit. They, to never have any real threat in the second half and Green Bay just being total control was unbelievable. And I mean, man, Matt LaFleur deserves a ton, a ton of credit for where he has this team, especially with all the drama, the COVID, the injuries, the everything. And to be at nine and three is massively impressive. We did get some news, uh, not great news, uh, you know, on Tuesday that we need to go over the first, you know, really the main one, is that Devondre Campbell tests positive for COVID. Um, first and foremost, the biggest importance is, of course, his health. So hopefully he is doing okay and can make a fast recovery. This is a football show, so we'll talk about it from a football standpoint. Obviously, it could not happen at a better time at the beginning of a bye week to give him potentially enough time to recover and come back for their next game against Chicago. Certainly not a guarantee, but what was your takeaway when you heard that news on Tuesday? Yeah, I I see a lot of people posting that they're unsure of his vaccination status. As of my last review of of players and the the protocols they've been following when I check at practice and other things throughout the week, Devondre Campbell, in my mind, was 
following unvaccinated player protocols. So that means he would take the full 10 days. And like you said, this could not be better timed with the buy. In fact, the, the first day coming off with testing and all of this, again, it, it allows him to take advantage of that 10 day window. And if everything is going smoothly, he will not miss any playing time. He is, in my opinion, the Packers defensive MVP of the year coming straight off the streets for $2 million. So the Packers definitely need him. I don't know what this would be like if we were putting up Chris Barnes and someone else, because the Campbell Barnes is certainly an incredible one two punch to have this year. But again, well wishes to him. And hopefully that this 10 day window goes smoothly for him. But again, to my knowledge, he's an unvaccinated player. Gotcha. So that that's important to know. And again, mostly because that means it would take the full 10 days for, for him to come back. You know, I'd be really intrigued, especially against the bears team that let's be frank, hasn't been that great. Um, I'd be really intrigued to see a Chris Barnes or in Burks uh, duo just to see for the sake of seeing it. Um, I would much prefer a Devondre Campbell, Chris Barnes. Let's just put that right out there. And as you mentioned, he's having a phenomenal season, Uh, but I have seen some flashes from Burks and obviously Chris Barnes is coming off of arguably his best game of the season, if not his career. So, uh, you know, I think those two could pick up the slack in a pinch if needed against a a team like the bears, but there's no question about it. If Devondre Campbell is out for any game, Green Bay is going to feel it. And that's going to feel like a loss again. Hopefully that is not the case. Hopefully he can come back for Chicago, but I'd at least be intrigued to see what Burks and Barnes could do in that situation. Intrigued for sure. I just don't know that Burks is at that level of consistency. Oh, he's not. That, you know, he's not. Campbell and Barnes are, are at this point switching off. I mean, Barnes was actually the sack leader against the Rams, but they're both just so quick and nimble with the muscle mass they have the ability to tackle almost anybody they put their hands on and they're going sideline to sideline at the end of this day so uh, I do think that this duo is critical sure a, a player too absolutely but and again it's the Bears you've got Detroit coming up as well winless so I don't think it'd be the worst thing in the world, but it wouldn't be ideal to just be relying on Burks to fill in for Campbell. No, certainly not. And if anyone uh, wants to really see where Chris Barnes is at with his, just his athleticism at this point, go watch the double pass from Cooper cup in just watch Barnes explode to cup in the backfield. It was an impressive play, how quickly he ID'd it, how quickly he got out there, laid a hit on Cooper cup, um, almost ended up being a touchdown either way um, on sort of a ridiculous play, you know, thankfully from a Packers standpoint, it was out of bounds, but watch how quickly Barnes got from point A to point B. And you can just tell he is playing with a level of confidence and a step quicker than he was certainly at any point last season, at any point in his college career, he has made quite the jump from undrafted free agent to where he is right now. Exactly. I think he's really making a name for himself in the NFL, whether he ends up staying with the Packers for his next contract or not. He, he is putting people on notice. Absolutely. So we also had the Aaron Rodgers Tuesday on the Pat McAfee show. Nothing of major substance, I don't think, unless, uh, you know, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong or if you had some huge takeaway, but he did talk about the potential surgery on his toe. There was the talk out there that he was not going to have surgery. There was some talk out there that he was going to have surgery. He confirmed that he is not having surgery at this point. They're going to evaluate it potentially, uh, you know, even next week to see where the toe is at, if it's healed any, and then make another determination at that point. But his big, I mean, to me, the big takeaway and his big point here was that no matter what, whether it's surgery or no surgery, he will not miss time. And regardless, that will be a key, you know key part of that decision-making process is not missing time. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, Aaron Rodgers is a fierce competitor and I respect the hell out of him for that. As I'm sure anybody does, it's very hard to be as good at anything in your human lifetime as Aaron Rodgers is at playing football. And, and that goes for quite a few greats in any athleticism, but this is very important to Rodgers probably you know, mentally and emotionally as well, not to miss time, given all the effort that it took to bring so many key Packers players back this season that were either here last year or previously, like Randall Cobb. So this year means a lot to Aaron Rodgers um, on the field and off the field. And at the end of the day, you know, he talked about what the surgery would be in a sense, which would be to immobilize that pinky toe. So in my mind, you know, I'm not a doctor, but you have to think that means either pins or a rod of sorts in order to, again, stabilize that pinky toe. Um, It it seems like it's a significant fracture. Again, if it's causing him this much pain and it involves taking either a numbing shot of sort pregame, which again, I I think people kind of jump to that. You know, I I know people were reporting on the broadcast that, oh, Aaron Rodgers can only feel nine toes. You know, that just is a common steroid or something like that. That's a very normal form of treatment for anybody, for a human who has a, a broken toe. So 
again, I, I, I think treatment has proceeded as should be and normally, but it, it's amazing to see that, yeah, it is impacting his play and yet he's still rushing a touchdown when he could only feel nine toes. So I think um, he, he's being more transparent maybe with his process than he would have been beforehand for better or for worse. But I think it's, it's interesting insight that he's choosing not to get surgery this week and instead is just going to rehab all the way through the bye week. Yeah, I'm not totally convinced that it's not uh, performance enhancing a broken toe because he's looked better these past two weeks with broken toe than he did even, you know, I think the weeks before then. But uh, I think that's, you know, to me, again, still a big takeaway. And I know for Aaron Rodgers, it's, you know, a massive pain and he has to play through that. And I certainly don't envy that from a fan standpoint, um, other than, of, of course, not wanting him to go through that pain. Um, he looks fantastic. I mean, he's able to outrace Jalen Ramsey to the end zone. He is able to move. He's able to throw. You know, I, I haven't seen any major issues with stepping into throws, mostly because uh, with the current offensive line, he hasn't had the ability to step into throws anyway. Uh, but overall, he, he's looked fantastic in these last couple weeks. I'm going to throw throw a few stats at you, Rachel. Um, I love it. Last two weeks, and actually credit Jake Morley for for pointing this out, Packaday podcast member. Um you know, since uh, since he started throwing deep again these last couple of weeks, six of 12, 228 yards, three touchdowns, no picks, 135.4 passer rating and a PFF grade of 93.1 when throwing deep. So he's hitting 50 percent of his passes. He's got three touchdowns, no picks. And he looks fantastic. I mean, there was the question earlier of where's that deep ball? I certainly was one of the people that was posing that question. It wasn't going well. These last two weeks, it's been going just perfectly. Yeah, and I think that's a combination of, again, this situation has forced him to hone in that accuracy maybe a little more than it was in the beginning of the season. I also think with Yash at the O-line, I mean, he said he almost forgot about that side for a period of time. I think everybody has come closer to the same page of adjusting to where Rodgers is at with this toe and his ability. The injury has kind of forced everybody to get, like I said, closer on that same page in order to be able to hit those marks. Yeah, I will say this. I am 43 plays through on my grading, my fancy grading sheet and my notebook and everything. 43 plays through of grading on the offense, which they decided to be a jerk to me on the bye week and throw like 84 plays of offense, which it's usually around like 60, maybe low 70. So they wanted to throw a few extra at me to just make sure I don't get rusty on my bye week. Right. Um, But through those 40 some plays, the offensive line was awful. Like it was real. And I know like, I know that people are like, you know, they only allowed one sack and it's going against Aaron Donald and stuff like that. They were so bad. And I I think Aaron was being a little bit kind, like Yash and Billy Turner got bull rush back into the quarterback on multiple occasions. Um, You know, obviously Aaron Donald was winning inside and that's not an easy matchup. And we know, and it goes without saying that the Rams have some freaking dudes on that defensive line. So it's, it's not, you know, unexpected, but it's, it's not necessarily for me here to throw the offensive line under the bus. And I'm hoping that they have an awesome second half as I go through it, but it's more to say it was, it made it even that much more impressive what Rogers was capable of doing with the fact that he's banged up with the fact that he's constantly getting pressure in his face. And um, he still made everything work, got rid of the ball on time. And I, I just thought it was, it was as, as rough as that looked for the O-line, it was that much more impressive for Rogers with what he was able to do. And I think, you know, you brought up Billy Turner and it's interesting. I very much remember a play. I think it was in the second half where he's in fact getting so bull rushed that he's pointing to Rogers where to throw it because he can't take this pressure. But again, a sort of, I don't want to say decline yet, but certainly a plateau in what Turner has been able to handle this season. I agree. I mean, so I'm, I've been lower on Turner than most. I think he has struggled. So there's this weird dynamic, right? So I think he's a below average offensive tackle. I mean, just in general, like if you're grading him, he grades out, you know, in the negative more often than not where that stands for current NFL offensive tackles, I still think is actually like average, average ish. Like, I think that he is a good solid right tackle compared to his peers. I think just right now, offensive line play isn't that great, uh, especially at the tackle position in general. And I think he holds up more often than not. It's, it's, it's rare that he just gets like an, you know, instantly beat or anything like that. But I think for the people who think like, you know, Hey, Billy Turner's at right tackle in that position is just set it and forget it. You don't have to worry about it. It's not that. Oh, yeah. And he struggles more often than I think people, people recognize. 
Yeah, I do wonder bringing Bakhtiari back, will we see finally some flexibility there if they're willing to, once they have Bakhtiari back fully healthy, are they willing to move around four other positions and not just three? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do in that regard. The other stat I did want to throw out in regards to Rogers. So th- again, this one is courtesy of Ben Fennel, also a fan of the podcast uh, or friend of the podcast, I should say. Um, fan um, behavior. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, under 2.5 seconds, Aaron Rodgers throwing the ball this season, 15 touchdowns, zero interceptions, 73.5% completion percentage. So when Aaron Rodgers is able to be the distributor, the point guard, just getting it out of his hands, letting his playmakers do the work. The numbers are phenomenal. Again, anytime you're above 70% in completion percentage, you got 15 touchdowns and no picks, right. something is going right. So it's, it, there's clearly, clearly you can't just drop back and throw every single play. It's not going to work yeah. that easy. Um, but when he is able to get the ball out of his hands and let his playmakers do some of the heavy lifting, this offense has looked some of its best. You saw they had a concerted effort this past game with the Rams and their defensive front. And we saw a very effective performance from Rodgers once again. And we've seen, I mean, I could name at least three, four plays a game where he has to really fire off that bullet as quick as possible because of what the O-line is giving him and the coverage that he sees. So, and some of those have been overthrows, underthrows, misfires, whatever you want to call it. But like you said, those numbers are clearly showing more often than not that he is able to be accurate in those situations. Yeah. It, it's a really unique, um, you know, kind of just look at where he's been super successful. It's obviously been getting the ball out of his hands out quick. And I think that's something until Bakhtiari and, and hopefully Myers get back. I think that's something that they're going to have to continue. I think, You know, my one concern at this point with the O-line is we saw Green Bay play from ahead. And I, you know, to be fair, they were playing behind from, you know, against Minnesota, even in that fourth quarter, no Elton, and they were able to hold up fairly similarly. But I think if they get into a situation in the playoffs, if they didn't have Bakhtiari Myers and had to play with his current iteration, they have to play from behind and the other team can just tee off and pass rush and Rodgers can't just take some of the easy stuff that I would have a major concern with where the O-line play is. But I think if they can stay within the, the framework of the game and not get behind and, um, you know, kind of keep the defense guessing, I think they can make do up until they get some of those reinforcements. Yeah, I can see if it's a comeback situation with the way they're currently playing. I don't know that this is a reliable team with something on the line in that case. No, I think that's right. So let's, I want to jump over. You had this, this topic. I'm going to let you lead the discussion on this one. And then I'll jump in after with anything I can add, but I'll let you be the smart one. Uh, state of the secondary. So, you know, it's, it's obviously really interesting, you know, with uh, Jair being out and some of these corners stepping up, but I'm going to let you take the, take the reins on this one. Yeah. I just think at the end of the day, it's been fascinating to see the rise and breakout of Rasul Douglas. And when we look at who these keystone cornerstone pieces for the Packers are out on, you know, injuries right now, when you look at who's needed the most back, I just can't believe this far into week 13, 2021, that Jair Alexander, in my opinion, is not number one that the Packers need back right now because of what the secondary has been able to do. Their communication and their cohesion, I cannot stop describing them in that way right now, because even when they you know, are missing tackles. They're just like Joe Barry wanted, at least all on the same page. And they're doing the same thing. And the way they've been able to step up in the massive footprints of Jair Alexander, Eric Stokes might not be perfect, but he has still exceeded the ceiling for what a rookie should be able to do at that position. Rasul Douglas, again, plucked off the streets of the Cardinals practice squad. Even Chandon Sullivan has stepped up in big ways, but you have every corner able to provide something so significant and game-changing and the safeties with Savage and Amos. I mean, Savage has almost had a turnover a game for the past few weeks at this rate. And honestly, he is just able to at least break up passes that do turn the momentum of the game to and Amos is just on top of it, especially as they're nearing the red zone that I just think that the secondary is in such an amazing spot right now that it does not matter when Jair Alexander comes back, even if it's not for the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, if you would have told me that at the beginning of the season, I would, I frankly, I would have been like, it's, it's not season over. Cause I know they can overcome a lot with Rogers and stuff like that, but you're going to be really fighting tooth and nail to, to, you know, try to make an impact, get in the playoffs, things like that. What they've been able to do as a secondary. And I'll, I'll put it this way. The way this defense is moving cohesively is special right now. Yep. And 
we hear every once in a while of like in the NFL, you'll hear of like a team having like a no name defense and it's because, and they're still successful, right? It's usually a team that maybe doesn't have like a star or two. It's just all 11 players knowing what the other, you know, 10 are going to be doing at the same, at the same exact time. It's almost, is it an amoeba that goes in and out? I don't know. I'm not really good with science. um, I don't know. I don't know either, but it is, it, it moves like yeah. how, how the secondary like will spread out and then rally to the football. Like you will see on multiple plays in a game, just the entire team surround a player or a play yeah. or the ball. Yes. And it is so fun to watch because it has been something that has been massively missing. And I am telling you right now, if this defense had played this way with the gap integrity and playing the way that they, um, you know, just have collectively and cohesively, if they would have played that way against San Francisco two years in the NFC championship, there's no chance in hell that the 49ers are putting up those rushing numbers. You see these guys are gap sound, they're gap sure, they're assignment sure, they're where they're supposed to be. Like when is the last time, like there was a point two years ago and even parts of last season where you had guys all over the place. The gap integrity was terrible. You, like you would see blown assignments and blown everything like on a regular basis to be able and to- we point haven't to seen it. a blown assignment in weeks. Exa- a like. million percent. Like, I don't, I can't recall the last time where, you know, maybe you've seen like a safety jump a route or something sure. like that ever, you know, that's going to happen, but like just a complete blown assignment or somebody that's not in the right spot or the right, it just doesn't happen. And a massive, massive kudos to Jerry Gray in the secondary and, and Joe Barry, because this is, for, I know Devondre Campbell has been a really big signing. Razul Douglas was a big find to me. The talent is still less at this point because no Z and no, and no Jair, um, you know, from the last two seasons than it was, you know, the last couple of years and he's making do with it. And it's, it's been really, really fun to watch. Absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right with the gap integrity and the way they can cohesively swarm the ball. It is beautiful watching this defense work from, from someone that's not a Packers fan, just an NFL reporter. It is beautiful watching what this defense puts on tape and how much fun they have doing it and how happy they are doing it. I mean, again, Kenny Clark was so big on how much of a player's coach Joe Barry is. They love playing under him and they clearly work well with this chemistry. And it's just so awesome seeing how swimmingly this unit is handling it without their star power. And you know what? These guys are getting a chance to make a name for themselves. Darnell Savage is having one hell of a year. Yeah, no, he really is. And yeah, it's, it's fun to see all of these players. (laughs) <laughs> it's fun to see all these players come together and start making a name for themselves. And I'm really, really intrigued to see if, if, and when everyone's healthy, how they deploy these corners, because you can't fit all of them on the field at the same time. And it's going to be interesting how they figure that all out to me. Well, and, I said it. and that's my question for you, I guess. So let's say Jair comes back. Who do you want to see opposite him right now? I want to see, I mean, I think, I think the three best corners in my opinion are Douglas, um, obviously Jair and Stokes to me, those are the three best. The question is, do you want to move one of them inside and see if they can play better than Chandon? Or do you want to keep Chandon inside? And then obviously Jair is going to be out there no matter what. And then it's, do you, are you choosing between Douglas and Stokes? I think is the question. Um, You know, so that, I think that's number one and that's probably where I would go. I think I would lean at this point. I want Douglas and Stokes on the outside and Jair in the slot in those situations. Now, the huge caveat to that is yes, Jair might be back, but what's the state of his shoulder? If his shoulder's a mess, you can't play him in the slot because that you need to be able to, you know, fill the run and, you know, lead with a shoulder and take guys out. If you've got, I know they don't play Derrick Henry, but just as an example, you got Derrick Henry coming at you, you know, you got a bum shoulder. That's not the place where you want Jair Alexander is to be in the slot. So I don't trust Stokes in the slot. I don't trust Douglas. I don't know. I would maybe give Douglas a shot in the slot. I won't say I won't trust him there. Um, but there's a chance that, you know, if, if Jair can't play there, that you have to just keep Sullivan there. And then again, it's, it's Jair. And I would, I, I, I don't know. That's a really interesting debate between Stokes and Douglas. I would almost lean Douglas, but I think they would go Stokes. I think they could treat this position in somewhat of a rotational way. I guess I like they right. envisioned Rogers and Cobb, even though I don't think that's panned out the way that they <laughs> wanted it to, but I, I really think it could be a play by play basis. I'd also be interested 
if they were going to move Chandon out, perhaps moving Kevin King inside. I don't think that's the ideal combination. But again, if you're looking for that rotation, that's someone that I'd be willing to give a couple snaps there. And uh, before injury, you know, early in the year, Kevin King had replaced Shannon Sullivan in the slot as a, you know, you know, nickel corner. So there's a lot of options. And I think the other thing too, that, and to your point is they can match up too. Right. So I think one of the reasons we saw Kevin King get the start in the slot uh, in that game was because there were bigger receivers in that game, bigger threat, tight ends, things like that, that I think they wanted to protect against that. It was just a better matchup for King than it was for Sullivan. If you end up with, you know, going up against a bunch of big, you know, physical receivers, then yeah, Kevin King actually in the game makes a lot of sense. You still have Jair out there. And then maybe you do want to play Razul Douglas, who's a little bit more of a bigger physical corner and you can match up in that regards. If you're playing a, a faster team, like a Minnesota team, again, with, you know, yeah. Jefferson and Thielen on the outside, we saw Kevin King in that game. Kevin King ha- can't hang with either yeah. of those receivers. That's when you need to go Stokes and Jair on the outside and then figure out the other. So I think they have the ability to match up much better. And I think they're going to be able to do that whenever, hopefully when everyone's healthy. It also sucks that Savage is, is honestly outplaying himself at this point because he played a ton of nickel at Maryland when I covered him there. And I would love to see him back in that position here. But again, I just think he's proven himself too valuable to be stuck there, unfortunately. But if that wasn't the case, you know, if we could pair Amos with someone else, I would love to see Savage inside. And I think that's the other issue too, right? If you put Savage there, then you're probably leaning on Henry Black back at safety. Yeah. And I don't and right think now, that is know, not Henry good. Black is one of your top 11 is your best uh, scenario. So yeah. the last thing I want to discuss very, very quickly, and we'll get out of here, Josiah DeGuara, because I do feel like you can start seeing him gain some confidence. And I talked to, to Aaron Negler about this on Let's Talk Football earlier this week. And, you know, I feel like a few years ago, and I don't know if, if you remember this or not, because I don't think you were covering the team at the time, but there was the the deep ball against Seattle to Robert Tunney. And it was like his first big touchdown that he caught. And it was sort of the start of the Robert Tunyon time where he just like, that was the play where you could see he started to gain some confidence and things kind of took off from there. I feel like against Minnesota, the touchdown that he caught, it wasn't obviously a 50 yard or anything like that, but it was like a 20, 25 yarder on the run rolling out. Rogers had to give him a ball where, you know, kind of a a trust ball and Deguara came down with it. And then this week, arguably one of the biggest plays offensively in this game was the fourth and two to DeGuara. It's a three point game in the second half. If the Packers stall out there, the Rams have the ball and the ability to go down and either tie or take the lead in the second half, which changes the game entirely. But he trusts DeGuara on the play, rifles the ball into him. He makes the catch and you can just see a little bit, the DeGuara confidence going up. And I think that can actually be a pretty significant development for this offense. Absolutely. I think there are a number of compounding factors that make that relationship very significant right now. I mean, first of all, quarterback's relationship with his receivers and pass catchers is incredibly special to begin with. And again, so much trust is psychologically invested there. We are definitely seeing a burgeoning relationship. Obviously, it's nowhere close to the the amount of security that Devontae Adams has on the field. But I think it's a tremendous effort on DeGuar's behalf as he's recovered from injury to gain Aaron Rodgers trust in these game changing situations um, time and time again. Now at this point, this is certainly something that's growing now. I don't know what this means when Tunyon eventually returns, but at the end of the day, this is something that is instrumental for DeGuar's both personal growth in the NFL and professional to be able to be on this level of trust with Rodgers. And I think we're seeing when players this season on this team have been given an opportunity to step up and take on a bigger role far more often than not they have. And I'm excited to see if DeGuara can continue that. He needs to improve his cut block. He might be the best, the worst cut blocker in the entirety of the NFL. Not that one. (laughs) No. So, but other than that, he is gaining some confidence, especially as a route runner, as a catcher, you can see that coming along and uh, I'm excited to see where, where that continues. Rachel, amazing stuff as always. Where can we find your work? Where can we find you on Twitter? Tell us something exciting. Um, at Rachel Hopmeyer. Ooh, something exciting. Uh, I don't know. I watched Joe Barry drop the F-bomb a lot this week. That was fun. <laughs> that was a good tweet. That was, they got some action and people were very intrigued. Me and by Nicole it. standing there and we were like, I don't know if I've ever seen someone that happy in life ever. And I don't know. I've been around a lot of happy people. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody as happy about anything ever as Joe Barry was with that win. So. I think it was a really underwhelmed uh, storyline going in. Like it should have been a bigger storyline that it was Barry versus his former team. And the fact that 
they hired a, an external defensive coordinator when they had Barry on staff, had the ability to hire him. They didn't. Then he gets his opportunity in Green Bay. I'm sure he felt, you know, uh, you know, left out by the fact that he didn't get an opportunity, a real opportunity to be the defensive coordinator for the Rams and take the reins. Um, and instead he ends up going to green Bay. And so far it's worked out really well for, for both Barry and the Packers. So, uh, good for him. He earned it. And that defense was flying around the football. It was fun to watch. Yeah. Flying. They, they are certainly ball magnets. He has trained these guys just so flawlessly. It, it's honestly, I think that's the biggest win for the Packers this year is in 2021, they had a hell of a lockdown defense. They did. It's, it's fun to see. And yeah, I mean, it's a week to week league. Who knows what's going to happen the remainder of the season, but the way that this team is playing defensively, it's, it's exciting. It's fun to watch and it literally could help propel them on their path moving forward. We'll see where that ends. Rachel, thank you so much. We will see you in a week. Enjoy your bye week. I'm sure we'll talk before then, but until next time for everyone listening, make sure to go subscribe, hit the like button, hit subscribe. We always appreciate it. Follow Rachel's work on Twitter, but until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.